Hello everybody, my name is Jimmy Smith and welcome to the Wine with Jimmy YouTube channel. Uh, this is a WSET level 3 mock theory examination. This is part one of four. This first part, part one, is available as free content on the YouTube channel, but parts two, three and four are only available to our members of the winewithjimmy.com e-learning portal where we have a wonderful uh, portal which is designed to help you through examinations such as WSET levels one, two, three, and four. Uh, you will find flashcards, revision sessions, multiple choice questions, short written answer questions, and exclusive video content on there as well. Um, so this is, as I mentioned, the first part of four. Each of these parts will have some multiple choice questions and one short written answer question worth 25 marks. Um, across all four parts, that is exactly the same amount of marks which are available in the WSET Level 3 Theory Examination. So all four parts together are basically an ex a theory examination. This is created by me. I have been an educator of the WSET courses for well over 15 years now. Uh, and it is my specialist area. And um, my wine school has won the Best Educator of the Year Award in 2018 as well. Okay, so let's go through these. I will run through these with you. Um, there is a slide each time which you can obviously have a go at answering. You can pause it and answer the question and then see if it correlates with my answer. And I'll work through the questions with you. So the first thing, what will happen when you go into your examination, um, you will actually have the multiple choice area. So we're going to go through 10 multiple choice questions and then we'll go through a short written answer question. Just to reiterate, according to the examiner's reports, uh, which are issued by WSET, it is the short written answer question which is still the most challenging for students across the world. The multiple choice generally has quite high pass rates. Um, it is the short written answer which is understanding the world of wine, which is the trickier area. Whereas multiple choice, of course, the answer is in front of you and it's about learning. So let's go through these. The first one then, which of the following is a Beaujolais cru? This is a typical structured question for a multiple choice. You will have the question and then you'll have four answers to work through. So we're gonna look at those. Now it's important to immediately understand what a Beaujolais cru is. What does that mean? We know that Beaujolais is a region um, that is a region which is uh, to the south of the uh, of Burgundy and then north of uh, the Northern Road. Um, and the crew in Beaujolais, a crew is a village of the highest quality, of which there are 10 of them. And you will need to know a significant proportion of those. So you are now required to look at this list and select out of this list which one is a Beaujolais crew. So let's go through these. Um, they are all beginning with M, so it's a little bit more complex. You may get confused with some of the French village names. And here we actually do have four French villages, but uh, only one of them is from the Beaujolais region. Uh, two of them are from Burgundy, and the last one would be from Bordeaux. So let's look at those. We first of all, and I'll do these ones in red. So we have Mercury, and we have Montagny. Both of those are villages found in the Chalonnais in Burgundy. And then Margot at the bottom, I'll do this in sort of a bluish color. That is a village in the left bank of Bordeaux. So of course, this leaves us with only one option. And that one option here is Morgon. Uh, Morgon, one of the most important of the Beaujolais villages, probably producing some of the most full bodied wines along with Moulin Avant. Uh, so very structured and very full-bodied wines. Another question we could sort of ping in here is what grape variety would you expect a Morgon be, to be made out of? And Morgon would be made out of uh, Gamay, as I'm sure you guys would have guessed. So let's pop that down, Gamay. Okay, so actually quite fuller styles of Gamay in Morgon. Okay, so that is our first question. Question two, um, 
we have uh, we have a, um, a a process here autolysis in sparkling wine results in and you need to collect uh, um, select the correct answer out in the next four so we need to understand what autolysis is so autolysis is the reaction between the yeast the dead yeast uh, which has formed a sediment or lees and the wine so it's a reaction between that wine and the lees uh, and it will give some certain characteristics so what we've got here is autolysis in sparkling wine results in floral grapey flavors high alcohol low alcohol and bready biscuity flavors so basically we can discount the alcohols autolysis is not to do with sugar it is in fact when the yeast has died and no more sugar is being converted into alcohol so neither high or low alcohol are correct in this instance so we can immediately get rid of b and c uh, floral grapey flavors would in fact be produced um, from a wine that doesn't go through autolysis. Uh, things like muscat, for instance, that make asti. So we can, in fact, put down here that, uh, so you can remember this, let's scribble this down. This is a typical definition or description for asti DOCG, which is produced via the asti method. The asti method avoids autolysis to protect those very aromatic floral and grapey flavors. So as a result here, we are left with D as our answer, and D is bready, biscuity flavors. Those lees will give those characteristics, maybe um, things like pastry, um, dough, bread, biscuit. Um, that certainly happens with extended lees contact. Um, also, lees contact can mitigate the acidity, so they can balance acidities, uh, which is quite important, and also add texture and roundness. Um, so uh, that is something else to also look out for. You always should remember that Lee's contact really has three main principal uh, um, key points. Uh, balancing acidity, adding texture and richness, and then potentially adding flavors and aromas like D here, bready, biscuity flavors. Question three. Now you'll see that these questions are not split into sections, so you don't just get all French questions, then Italy, they are random. So you will get some questions from France and from Spain and New World, uh, sparkling, fortified, viticulture, vinification. It is a mixed bag. Um, what are Vinos de Pagos? Uh, so Vinos de Pagos, so these Pago wines are um, very specialist wines. Uh, so here are your answers. Are they red wines from Chile? Now we know, so Vinos de Pagos has a very Spanish ring to it or a Spanish speaking ring, ring to it. So the, uh, in Chile, Spanish is widely spoken uh, and very similar. So therefore that could intent, potentially be an answer. Four to five wines from Spain. Um, now we know that the fortified wine from Spain is sherry and all the associated, associated styles. Uh, so that can't be true. Um, but some of you who have done some studies may know that there are some Pago uh, um, names around the sherry region. Uh, wines from a single estate with a high reputation. So these are very qu high quality wines or simple inexpensive wines. Uh, D is aiming at like table wine, which is not uh, um, the uh, category that we have for that. That's uh, Vino de España. Red wines from Chile um, do not have any classification, so that is incorrect. Four to five wines from Spain, of course, sherry related wine. So you are left with this one. C, wines from a single estate with a high reputation. Uh, there are um, uh, nearly 20 of these today in Spain. Uh, these Vino do Pagos, uh, there are always some new ones being added on an annual basis. They can lie outside of DOs, but they can be inside DOs as well, but they often have an exceedingly high reputation and um, can be made quite often from international grape varieties. A little bit like the equivalent of a Super Tuscan, but dotted across a lot of Spain, mainly around places like uh, Navarra, Aragon, uh, and then going down towards places like Castilla-La Mancha uh, and bordering into Valencia, these kind of central areas. So Vino de Pagos, wines from single estates with a high reputation. 
Where is the Tavel AOC located? So the Appellation Origine Contrôle of Tavel. So the answers here are going to be all French because AOC has been mentioned here. And here they are. Uh, so we have Northern Rhone, um, so of course famous for Syrah. Southern Rhone, more famous for Grenache. Languedoc Roussillon, which is the area that stretches from where the Rhone empties into the Mediterranean and down to the uh, Pyrenees border of Spain. Uh, and then Provence, which is actually from the Rhone River again, but this time across to the Italian border. So these are your four options. Now, immediately, Tavel has a very distinctive characteristic about it. Something you must very much well know here is that it is rosé production or pink production. So Pavel only makes rosé wines from the right bank of the Rhone River. It looks on the left bank on a map, but you follow the direction of the river. So you're actually going down and it actually then sits on the right hand side um, near Lirac, which is another AOC nearby, but it's a, a, a rosé only producing style. So this is therefore in the Southern Rhone. It is close to the Rhone River in the Southern Rhone. It is not the Northern Rhone. You do not need to know any rosé specific wines in the Northern Rhone. Languedoc Roussillon, it could have been, I suppose. Uh, there's nothing there to really eliminate that. And Provence, probably. But you don't need to know much about Provence. Uh, really, you only need to know Côte de Provence, which does make rosé, and then Bandol, which, once again, makes quite a bit of rosé. Um, but it is Southern Rhone is our answer in terms of its location here. Now you have a description. Sometimes uh, you may find that this is a way that questions could be um, asked. Um, there are many ways that we can create questions here um, within our schools like West London Wine School. Um, it might be simple uh, questions like we've just gone through. Sometimes maybe descriptions we can come up with. And sometimes you have to pick from lists. It's all the typical ways really of creating a multiple choice question. So here you've got a description, dark, full-bodied red wines with powerful tannins produced almost exclusively from the Mourvedre grape are produced where? Um, so Mourvedre is a very key grape variety which um, is famous in the south of France. It actually originates from Spain but it's famous in the south of France now, I'm not sure that's going to help you too much with the list we've got coming up because many of these are located in some parts of the south of France. The only one that isn't is Cornas. Cornas is actually located in the northern Rhone and that it's produced from Syrah. And it's the most southern tip of the northern Rhone. Um, and then you have Madaran and Cahors. These are in the south of France, but the southwest of France. Um, let's put down what these are all famous for, because I think that will help you further in your studies. So we know that Cornas is all about Syrah, and it must only be, in fact, 100% Syrah. Uh, it's a very key fact about it. Madran is famous for Tanat, which produces very structured and tannic wines. Cahors is famous for Malbec. Uh, also in the southwest of France. So you are basically then left with Bandol, if you didn't know it already. Of course, Bandol, this coastal village, which is only about 20 minutes from Marseille, is very famous for producing the exact description up there from Mourvedre. Well, it's very famous for red wines, but in fact, there is more rosé production here in Bandol, but it is the red wines which carry the fame and the classic note. So that is a very key area for it. Next question, which of the following is not a fungal disease? So once again, you may get questions which are regional, country, grape, but you can also get viticultural questions such as this one. So we are looking here uh, and it's actually put it in bold here and in capitals, you have not a fungal disease. So you need to therefore pick the odd one out of these four. And here you have four names. Um, anything with the word mildew, which is your two at the bottom, are diseases, fungal diseases affected and propagated by normally water and uh, the, um, the abundance of water. So these are um, the mildews, which originally come from the Americas. They're now found across all of the world. 
uh, for viticulture and agriculture. So you can immediately discount those two because they are fungal diseases. And then, of course, in your studies, you will have learned that noble rot, which is the first answer here, and we can put that next to it. Botrytis cinerea is its uh, more technical name, but noble rot uh, is another fungal mold as well, uh, which uh, affects the skin of the grapes and, and really extracts the water out of the grape, shriveling it up, as you know, with botrytis. So therefore, you are left with the answer B, which is millerandange. So millerandange is actually a, um, a problem of flowering. So this often will happen in around sort of peak flowering. Uh, and peak flowering, let's say in the northern hemisphere, will be somewhere around sort of June time. Um, and this, of course, is when the flowers start to abundantly um, show. Uh, and eventually they are, of course, they carry all the uh, the male bits and the female bits for uh, asexu asexual reproduction. Um, but if it's very rainy um, and it's windy at this time, um, and this inclement weather affects the flowering, it can uh, cause poor fruit set, poor flowering and fruit set. Uh, and you'll get some berries that don't form properly. They are small, they are seedless, uh, and they will have to be discarded. The name for this is Millerandange. Uh, so it has nothing to do with a disease or fungal disease. Uh, it is the um, unsuccessful flowering and fruit set um, at that time of year. Question seven. Rutherglen, we're going into the new world now, is renowned for what style of wine? So what it is it what is it known for? What is it famous for? Uh, and let's go through the answers here. So is Rutherglen famous for fizzy, sparkling wines? Is it famous for fortified wines? Uh, or light white wines or light red wines? Um, Often uh, Australian wines are not on the lighter side of life, so C and D seem a bit silly in their answers. So you're left with A or B, really, and it is B. I'm, I'm sure you will know this. Um, Rutherglen is famous for muscats, uh, made from a variety, but often in a very dark style, often from black muscat, producing these wines that are oxidized, um, very well aged, uh, and they are very complex and rich. So these are Mother Rutherglen muscats. So the answer, of course, here then, because they are they are fortified with grape spirit, is B fortified. Okay. Um, question eight: Which of the following wines can be produced in a dry style? Um, so this could be a question which is for Germany wines, uh, Loire Chenins, you know, wines that have diversity behind them in terms of their sugar levels. Um, it could also be something like champagnes and so on. But they've listed here four uh, styles, Auschlaser, Cabernet, Spätlaser and Eisfein. OK, um, now you will know that many of these are very famous as sweet wines. In fact, all four of them are famous historically for sweet wines, um, with Cabernet being the least sweet and Eisfein being the most sweet out of that uh, list. Um, but they can be fully fermented to dryness, some of them. So let's have a look at that. Um, they're giving you some combination answers here. This is another way that multiple choice questions can be formed. Um, a lot of students initially look at these questions and go, oh my God, this is gonna be complex. But to be honest, they are actually very easy because you eliminate and it really then is quite easy to pick the remaining answer. Um, so let's have a look at these terminologies here, these four Prada Ketzfein terminologies. Um, so I'll do this in green. Um, the, the, the lowest uh, level of, um, uh, uh, of Prada Ketzfein is in fact Cabernet. If it is just listed as Cabernet, then that will be a wine with sugar. But it can be fully fermented and be labelled as a Cabernet Trocken. So that immediately is one that we'll have in our combinations, which is going to be A, B or D in our answers. Spätlaser is the next category up from Cabernet, and that can also be listed as Spätlaser Trocken. If it's just Spätlaser on the label, it will be sweet. If it's Spätlaser Trocken, it will be dry and fully fermented to dryness. Trocken meaning dry. Um, technically, also, 
Auschlaser, which means selected harvest, can also be fully fermented, though this is very rare. I'm going to put a little asterisk there. It tends to be rare, but by law and technically, it can be a trocken. Eiswein is only sweet, so this cannot be produce, produced uh, as a, um, uh, a dry wine, so only sweet. So we are left with a combination one, two, and three in this one. Uh, and that is, of course, going to be the answer D, as it says down here at the bottom. OK, so quite easy to work through that in terms of the combinations. Viticulture in Cafayati is significantly influenced by. So quite, um, quite challenging because you require to know where this is. Cafayati is in Argentina in the Salta province. Immediately when you think about Argentina, think, think, think altitude. It is massively affected by altitude levels. Vineyards ranging for the most part from 500 meters to 3000 meters. So it is a significant player um, and Cafayate is one of the highest areas for viticultural attitude. Um, so Argentina's wine regions are not near oceans or seas. Um, there is very little rainfall in Argentina, so noble rot is very rare. The rainfall, like I just mentioned, is very low in Mendoza, only around 200 millimeters of rain per annum. So very low. So you are, of course, left here with altitude. Um, it is a significant characteristic in shaping and crafting the wines of Argentina. Okay, so high altitude. Which grape variety is used to make Garvey D-O-C-G? So Garvey is a town which is located in the southeast part of Piemonte, which is in the northwest of Italy. It's a beautiful place uh, and it's about uh, an hour's drive away from places like um, uh, Alba and Barolo. Um, Gavi is a white wine. OK, you'll need to know the major principal grape variety behind Gavi. It is bolded in your textbook. Here you've got Trebbiano, Malvasia, Cortesi and Grecetto. So Trebbiano is found all over Italy. There are limited amounts, however, in, um, in Piemonte. Malvasia is also quite limited. They tend to be much more around uh, central parts of, uh, of Italy. And Grecetto is the same as well, more famous in Umbria, uh, down near Tuscany, for example. So your answer here is Cortesi, which is famous for Garvey. So that is one you'll have to just remember. A grape of Piemonte um, and it can make some nice styles, but not the most complex of examples. So um, once you've got past your multiple choice questions, of which there will be 50 in your examination, your proper examination, it then moves on to short written answer. As we are splitting these into four parts, we're only doing these 10 multiple choice questions. And now we're going on to the short written answer area. Um, so here you'll, uh, you'll be going through your, your examination pack and suddenly you get to your written questions of which there are four. We're gonna go through one here and it says Italy. Uh, so it will normally say Italy um, or it will say something around the topic that you are talking about. The topic could be a country of origin, it could be region of origin, it could be grape variety. There's a number of ways that an examiner like me could uh, put grape uh, questions together. Um, so here we have actually got a country, Italy, and 25 marks are available. The questions are split into sections. Uh, so you'll see sometimes one mark, five marks, ten marks sometimes available. Here you have a label, Brunello do Montalcino. Um, name the grape variety or grape varieties of this wine. And there is one mark available for this. So Brunello is in fact a synonym, an alternative name for Sangiovese. So you'll need to write Sangiovese here. It is Sangiovese only as well. So you could put that down if you wish, um, but it is Sangiovese only. Um, so writing and spelling comes into play here. We do uh, obviously realize that you are required to uh, write lots of different linguistic words uh, from different languages. Um, if you get uh, a letter wrong here and there or the wrong um, 
uh, the wrong uh, vowel here and there, but it still looks like the word, then uh, I think there's going to be leniency there. Um, so Sangiovese, if you can spell it as close to that as possible, then please do. Um, how does this grape variety contribute to the style of wine? So, of course, this is talking about um, the grape itself. We're not talking about um, things like climate and weather. Um, we are talking about the, the real sort of genetic makeup of, of Sangiovese. And you can see that there is four marks available for here. So it's a good idea to write down as much as possible on this one. So what I've written for you here is that it contributes high levels of tannin. So Sangiovese is very high in tannin due to its uh, late capability of ripening. It's also very high in acidity and it's often very full of red fruits. And when this happens, when you put down something like red fruits, please do put examples. I think that uh, perhaps WSET examiners will be much more um, considerate when you put down examples. So things like cherry, plum, and also spices and herbs. Um, the grape variety also works well with oak um, in, in Barik or bo in Botte, which is a Slavonian oak. Um, I know that's not necessarily uh, the, the flavors from the grape, etc., but it does work well with oak. Sangiovese is capable of being matured for long, extensive times in oak. And all these things combined mean that they have excellent ability to age. So the things I've highlighted are actually five things here. So you've written more than enough, really, to get those four marks. Um, so please uh, make sure you, do, you put down at least four things here for, for this one. Um, now, if it says something like state and explain uh, for four marks, really you'll be stating two things and then explaining them to get the extra two marks. But here it's just really talking about how it contributes to the style of the wine, okay? Um, so this is all to do with WSCT expecting you to understand that there's a factor that affects the style. Uh, so the factor here, and I'm going to put this, let's put this in a nice uh, blue. The factor that you have here, and I'll, let me do a little arrow here. There we go. The factor is Sangiovese. Okay. Um, at level two, you just really need to talk about the factor. You just select it in a multiple choice. But now we need to know how that factor actually affects the style. Okay. So that's what we're talking about here. Um, so this question, uh, this answer here, uh, this is all about how that factor has affected the style. So this is very, very common in uh, across WSET, understanding how a specific thing will then impact the style. Okay, and we'll go through some more of this, I believe, as well. Um, state and describe the climate of this region. So that's going into a bit more detail. It's still a factor, but it's going into a bit more detail. So this is a warm Mediterranean zone. So it is on the Tyrrhenian Sea or just off it um, and it's central Italy. So it's going to be warm, warm Mediterranean, but will experience coastal maritime breezes. And they come in and they roll in off the Marema coast and they come up through the river valleys. Um, and this area has low rainfall, some of the lowest in Tuscany, uh, and it's one of the warmest parts as well. So that's stating and describing. We are not at this point saying how this impacts the style, okay? So at this point in time, we're talking once again about a factor. This is a factor, okay? It's gone into a bit more detail about it, but then the next thing often is how does the climate and weather patterns that we've just talked about to the style of wine? So now you are expressing how that factor affects the style. For five marks, um, the wines will regularly achieve high alcohols due to that heat, sunshine, and lack of rain. So big concentration in these grapes. They also tend to be fuller bodied, and that's due to the, uh, uh, and sorry, fuller bodied due to the high alcohols and richness. And due to the cool breezes, both from the sea and the mountains, and the diurnal range, that's the difference between the night and the day, very cold nights, they have very high acidities. Sangiovese is also a very late ripener, so it can ripen fully here in these growing areas, this growing season, with very high tannins due to that longer 
growing season. So that's how it impacts the style for five marks. So often you'll find the factor is one, two or three marks. And then how it impacts the style is often sort of three to maybe even eight marks. Um, okay. Here we have a different label and this may happen as well. So creating examination questions like this, you won't just focus on one label, it may go through many. Uh, and that's what I've done here. So here you have an Amaroni della Valpolicella Classico. That is what they've picked up on first, or I have picked up on rather on this. What does the term Classico, classico indicate on an Italian label? Um, so this is not just about learning about Amaroni. The Classico terminology will be found in the textbook right at the start of the Italian section. So that's where the description comes from. The term Classico acknowledges wines that have been made solely from the original classified land and include many of the best wines of that area. Wines outside of this area are the expansive zones and they're often of the lower quality. OK, so that's a very, very um, detailed and comprehensive way of, of talking about Classico across Italy. This could be an Orvieto Classico label or a Suave Classico label. Um, it's a very sort of classic answer for that. Um, this red wine is often dry or off dry, full bodied with high alcohol and intensely concentrated red fruits and spice. Answer the following questions. Why could this wine be off dry? So this is where this question has actually been converted, um, a kind of reverted round. So this is in fact the style. I have listed here the style of this wine and now we're going to go back to the factor that creates this style. So why could this wine be off dry? So a little bit of sugar. We first of all need to understand that off dry means just a bit of sugar. Uh, perhaps something like 10 or even 15 grams per litre of sugar. As it states here, the grapes are very concentrated in sugar due to the drying process of the grapes, that's passito, um, and it can be impossible for a winemaker to fully ferment this wine to dryness due to the exceptionally high levels of sugar. Uh, so they may get up to 15%, like it's on this label, but that hasn't converted all of the sugar to alcohol. So that's why there may be some sugar left behind. OK, Men mentioning the very big concentration of sugar, the Pesito method, and then what it does will get you the three marks there. The same description, but account for the full body and high alcohol by describing the production method. So we're going back really. I mean, we're, we're talking about a, a factor in this one. So let's go through that. Um, the pasito process, again, is used to increase structure and flavour by picking grapes early, drying them indoors, that's pasito, and concentrating those sugars and flavours. It really hones them in and concentrates them. The result is greater alcohol and fuller body. Some residual sugar can also add more body. I've added that in for good measure at the end as well. OK, five marks there, really um, talking about a couple of things and, and then divulging into it. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is the first part here. I hope you have found this very useful uh, to give you an insight in how an examiner potentially could structure questions and then how to answer them with confidence, going through multiple choice questions and the short written answer. If you have found this very useful and you would like to um, see the next three parts, uh, so three more written questions and then all of the multiple choice questions as well, please uh, visit the winewithjimmy.com website where you can uh, subscribe to our e-learning portal uh, and you can become a member to an, a wonderful array of information to help you through your studies. Uh, you'll have access to these mock theory examination parts uh, exclusive video content um, with even more short written answer questions, um, over 750 multiple choice questions, flashcards, revision sessions. There's plenty there to really help you and get you um, ready for your examination. So thank you so much for your time. I've been Jimmy Smith of The Wine with Jimmy. I hope to see you very soon and please take care of yourselves. Goodbye for now.